Do you fancy a cup of tea before we go anywhere? Yes? Yeah, good. Tea it is. Get along. On the only guard to get over 10,000 points, 10,032, he retains this marvellous Foster's uh, trophy. I'm not sure if he's got a big enough shelf. But um, anyway, Johnny Carr. <laughs> going to have an interview with Johnny Carr and then put the black gaffer tape around my mouth. Let me work out the, how long it is because it's about 44 years or something. My name is Johnny Carr. I started hang gliding in 1974. When we were at Mia in 1976, um, I remember Bob Wills was over there. And when we wrote down how long we had been flying, we had to put on the um, application form for the competition. And I wrote down, uh, whatever, two, three years. And Bob Wills wrote seven years. And I remember thinking, seven years? He's been flying seven years. And it just seemed like an eternity to me in them days. Um, but here we are 44 years later and I'm still flying and still competing. What actually got me into hang gliding was watching a program on News at 10 where Ken Messenger uh, it was one of the pioneers of the sport he was being filmed leaping off Mount Snowden and I watched this program with intent I just couldn't believe what I was going to see and when uh, he jumped off Snowden I said to my wife at the time if he survives this I'm going to do it and because it reminded me of when I was a kid and I used to go up on the downs and open my jacket on a windy day and think, wouldn't it be lovely just to glide down over all those trees at the bottom and land in the field? And just, it was everything that I wanted to do as a child. And I just was in awe of, of Ken Messenger doing what he did. Birds and flight and, you know, me being able to fly is so important. And, you know, it's, it's something that I never really get tired of. And I just I just love 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 the thought that we can do that and when I first saw it I, I just didn't believe that in my lifetime I know you could get in a jumbo jet and fly from here to America but that wasn't the same as being able to clip something onto your body and be able to just you know fly like the birds and when hang gliding come along it was the nearest thing to that and uh, that's why I just gelled with it instantly I just knew it, it, I had to do it and in, to know that you know we can fly like a bird in my lifetime is just something I'm just so glad to have been alive in that era. Took delivery of my first glider at Stenning Bowl and there, there, which is um, just above, literally above Stenning and in, along the South Downs and there was a few of us there and it's about 150 foot from top to bottom and we were standing on the top of the hill and it was my turn to fly and they clipped me in and I had a, one person on each wing and a person on the, on the keel at the back and I clipped in and I started to run and they said stop 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 and I said why are you stopping why are you stopping and they said were you really going to fly then and I went well yeah and they went oh, alright then we'll have another go. I think they just give me the chance of bottling out. And um, anyway, the next time I, f I flew, I took off and I launched into the air. And I didn't know a lot about it. I knew the basics. And I remember thinking to myself, do you know what? You know, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of this, you know. And, and I remember somebody saying to me, Ray, Ray Sigrist, he said, if you want to go up, you've got to push out. 
if you want to come down you got to pull in so I thought do you know what I'm not scared I'm, I'm really happy here I think I'll go higher so I'll push out so I pushed out and then it all went quiet there was no noise there was no sound because in the old days um, and I found this afterwards that all the time the glider was flapping at the back um, the trailing edge it was fine it was flying but when it stopped flapping you started to worry because it was going to stall and uh, it all went quiet and I thought oh it's all gone quiet and I've stopped and then suddenly the nose dropped and I was diving at the ground and the speed and the noise and the flapping and I thought oh my god and I remember he was telling me, oh, if you want to slow down, you've got to push out. So I pushed out and then the glider just slowed right down again and then climbed up in the air and then it all stopped again. And then it crashed down again and it just dived at the ground. And it was a series of pitch and dives all the way to the ground. At the last few feet, I pushed out and um, managed to sort of crash in a sort of undignified way. But not too hard fortunately i never hurt myself but um you know a very unelegant first flight and someone said oh johnny i think you stalled the glider and i said what's a stall <laughs> <laughs> if the wind was blowing 18 mile an hour you got blown backwards if it was blowing 14 mile an hour you could just about stay up um, if it was blowing less than 14 mile an hour you were on a slow descent to the ground and land at the bottom of the hill. So the window for flying was very, very critical. I say 14 mile an hour, we used to hold the little ventimeters up. And if the wind was blowing 14 and you had the ability to stay up, you could stay up. Um, and soaring was, was what it was all about, is seeing how long you could stay in the air. Um, and, and the major goal was to try and top land. If you could take off saw the hill and then land back on top that was a, a major goal and when I, I my first flight um, from my first flight to my first top landing was about 34 flights I think it was 32 34 flights I had of doing top to bottom before I managed to do a top landing and the feeling of doing your first top landing was just unbelievable unbelievable <laughs> I know it sounds silly now when you when you look at everybody they just do it but to actually top land was just such an achievement in them days um, because you know once you took off you were nearly always going down and then uh, 360 and, and, and the, the the first time um, someone was doing 360s now uh, let me just explain 360s in 1970s was an artistic maneuver uh, we all do 360s now to stay in the air to you know to utilize thermals and to use it as a means of getting to cloud base um, but in them days a 360 was a bit like a you know an ice skating maneuver it was oh someone's going to do a 360 and I remember someone said to me that Ray Segrist had done a 360 and I went wow where is he and um, and he was a, a truly hill and I made him walk from the bottom of the hill to the top so that he could show me him doing the 360. And do you know what? It, the hill's about 300 foot high and he took off and he flew out from the hill and by the time he had completed his 360 degree turn to get back into wind, he had used the whole of the height of the hill to do that, which is, you know, ridiculous now, but that's how bad the performance of the early hang gliders were. He just did it in, in, in 300 foot to do one 360 but um but then the skill was to do a 360 in lift and we all went to Rossilli and um and we were flying the cliffs at Rossilli and that's when I did my first ever 360 in lift and you know my first 360 funnel enough was quite good the second one and it's all on video somewhere um of me doing it I actually stall it halfway round but it's nothing drastic happens it just uh you can see the nose drop and then it recovers and then I carry on round. But um, yeah, 360s in lift was, was, the, was the trick. And then by accident once, uh, I, I was flying a, a, a prototype gulp at Bow Peep Hill, um, which is near Eastbourne. And, um, and Miles Handley put me on this thing called a gulp. It was a prototype. And I took off and... I went out and I just thought, oh, I'll try a 360. So I did a 360 
And then I thought, oh, I'll try another 360. And I did another one, and then another one, and then another one. And I noticed that the things were getting further away. And I got so high that when I landed eventually, uh, I was told I went out of sight, which was a bit strange. And, and I suddenly realized, I suddenly thought, do you know what, I am started looking around the glider and starting to think of things that could go wrong because I was so high and we had no parachutes or anything, no, no reserve shoes in them days. And, uh, and, uh, and I started to sort of think, oh, I'm not so sure about this. So I was quite happy to get down. Anyway, I eventually top landed and I just thought, once I knew I was alive, I thought, I've got to have one of those. And I ordered a, a, a gulp off of Miles Handley and, and, you know, they could hardly steer the things, but um, I, I managed to sort of, you know, work out how to steer the thing and control it. And it was a bit like you programmed it in to do a turn and then you programmed in advance when you wanted to stop it turning. <laughs> it was really weird. <laughs> but um, yeah, happy days. Because it was so new, everybody wanted to see it. People used to come from all over the place and say, oh, the bird men are out on Mill Hill today. So they would just go up there, you know, in the hundreds and spectators would just be watching. I suppose, it, you know, they're just watching to see if anyone's going to have an accident, probably. But uh, um, it was, yeah, there was a lot of people used to, used to come and, and watch us flying. It was a more social uh, atmosphere. Um, because people were on, you know, literally on the hill and it was, you know, you'd bring your partners, you'd have a picnic, you'd have a few minutes flight or two or three flights to the bottom and then walk back up and then you'd have a flask of tea or something and it was a much more social, uh, uh, social event, hang gliding, when it first started. Yeah, um, my first ever competition uh, was at Cam Long Down. And it was, a, I'd been flying a month. I'd been flying, I picked up my glider in something like June 1974. And this was in end of July, August time, 1974. And it was at Stroud in Gloucester, um, or near Stroud. And Cam Long Down was the name of the hill. And I just went there because I wanted to meet other people and just see who else was flying. And, uh, and that was a, my first ever competition and I was flying they had different type of gliders they had large gliders medium gliders and small gliders and so I was flying the large gliders and um, because my wasp CB it was 240 square foot and it was a huge like a marquee almost and um, I did well on it I was surprised you know that I just I did what they ask of me and uh, and ended up, I won the class three, the big gliders, you know, and probably because I had a bit more muscle at the time than a lot of the others did. So I was able to manhandle this glider. Um, and then I realized, oh, you know, I'm in a competition and I've won part of the competition. I think I came third overall. And I thought, oh, you know, this is good. It's a sport I could do because, you know, at school I was hopeless at sports and, uh, you know, no one ever picked me for teams. And suddenly here I am. You know found something that I could do naturally and I was just very pleased and that's where I got the competition bug. The competition scene in the UK really was really Brian Milton's vision and um, he's I remember him saying that one day Johnny there'll be so many competitions that you can go to all over the world that you will be able to just you know pick and choose which competitions you want to go to and I remember saying, do you really think so? And I, I doubted it because, you know, competitions were so few and far between in them days. And, um, and as you know, here we are now, you can, you know, fly to Florida, you can fly to Brazil, you can fly to America, you can go all over the world and, and compete in virtually any hang gliding competition you want. But in them days, it was really, really um, difficult to find a competition to go to. 76 was was Cosson and uh, I went there um, 
and that was a big item, and they were taken off from so high. I mean, we, we fly in the UK, we take off hills, you know, 300 feet, 500 feet, and if you go to the Blorange in, in, in Abergavenny, you, you know, you're taking off, at, you know, a 900 foot hill, top to bottom, whatever it is there. Um, and we were looking at Cossin and people were taking off at 1800 feet and there were little dots in the sky and saying, look, 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 there's someone up there and you point and you can say, where, where, where? And you see this little tiny dot and uh, it would be hang gliders taken off from, from Cossin. And so, yeah, that was a, a big, um, that, that was a, 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 a big competition for me to go to Cossin. Yeah. I, I was flying a, a design glider that Miles Handley made, uh, a Griffin and, um, you know, I came tenth in that, and that was my first big sort of, uh, you know, task in a in a, a bit a big competition uh, for my first big result actually. So I was really pleased with coming tenth. Funny thing is, we there was a, a shop window in Cosson that had that was obviously the, the showcase of all the trophies that were going to be presented. And I remember looking at this 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 little trophy there, and it was it was about that big. And I, I remember thinking to myself. You know, I'd love to win that one. It would just be so nice to win that trophy. Just get a trophy. It would just be. It would be so lovely to to get a trophy, and um, and I couldn't believe it because when when they actually presented the trophies, all the big ones went to obviously the people that, that were in the different classes that beat me, and um, and he said, and in tenth place, Johnny Carr, and they handed me this trophy, and it was the one that I looked at in the in the in the shop window, and I remember thinking, oh my God, you know, so I treasured that trophy. Still got it on my on my window sill now. 1977, the league was formed. Uh, there wasn't a, I'm aware of. I don't remember going ab abroad. Um, in 1978, there was a European Championships at Cosson, um, and Bob England from the UK he came second, and I came fourth. Um, and we were flying Birdman Birdman Moonrakers um, at, at the time, and that put Ken Messenger on the map big time in Europe, and. Um, he, you know, he sold a lot of gliders, you know, off, off of those results. So um, that was 78. Um, in 79, there was the World Championships, and that was in France at Grenoble, um, Saint-Hilaire. Uh, and I came second in that one. So I, that was my best, t still to date, my best ever, ever, ever result in a, in a World Championships or European Championships to like. And... Um, yeah, and you know, I was a bit gutted because if I hadn't have gone round the wrong side of a pylon, um, I probably would have won that because you know I, I was lying fourth at the time and I dropped from fourth to sixty third place and then uh, then you know bounced back and kept winning. But Joseph Guggenmoss, um, he was flying a prototype glider uh, similar to what I was. Uh, I was flying a Chargus. Cyclone um, was the name of the glider I was flying, and it was a, you know, a bit of a radical design at the time. Um, and Joseph Guggenmoss was an inventor of gliders in Germany, and um, you know, he 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 deservedly beat me. But uh, he's a bit lucky I didn't go the right way around that pylon, otherwise I would have beaten. And Gerard Teveneau, uh, the French top pilot. He was third, so it was a that was a, a, a fabulous competition, and that was all on my, during my thirtieth birthday celebrations as well, because I had my thirtieth birthday whilst I was at that competition, which is fifth of August in nineteen seventy nine. When I first started flying, it was all about trying to stay in the air. So, um, you know. I think Tony Beresford, who still flies now, funnily enough, Tony Beresford, he flies down in, in uh, Wales. Um, he, I think, had a, a, the record of two hours on the Long Mind, uh, not the Long Mind, on the Hay Bluff. And um, I'd read somewhere that he had managed to stay up for two hours and other people were staying up for about 20 minutes on the South Downs. And so it was a challenge to, to stay up in them days. Um, but it got ridiculous because it got too easy to stay up and then people would you know be in the air and I think uh, one that somebody took in off in Hawaii and was stayed in the air for literally um, 24 hours or something silly so they realized that we got to do something different so then it became about how far you could go so you know distance became the thing and which still is relevant today really 
well, my first ever cross-country flight was um, from Devil's Dyke, and I would try and fly across Brighton, which I did, and land on the race hill. And that was my first ever cross-country flight that was of any, of any note. It was to take off at Devil's Dyke, fly across Brighton and land on the race hill. And I had a friend who lived at the bottom of the race hill um, who would bring me back to the dyke. So that was quite handy, really. Um, and my first really um, good flight uh, was... Uh, people had beaten that flight. They had flown to Seaford and places like that. One day I took off at Devil's Dyke and got into some sea breeze, which I didn't know it was at the time because there was clouds forming below me and I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> and uh, I ended up at Cooden Beach, which was something like 28 miles. And uh, when I got back to the dike, they went, that's it. No one's ever going to break that. We might as well give up now. You never get, no one's ever going to get any further than that. You've done it, Johnny. You know, you've ruined it for everybody now. And I said to him, look, you know, it's not because I've, Oh, 28 miles there's the whole coast that, that's open you know and I, it, it will get beaten and um but yeah such was that you know it gone from like 15 miles to 28 miles everybody was going that's it it's all over and of course we, we all know you know people going to margate and, and deal and dover and places on a regular basis now but um yeah that was the a big deal in them days and then Michel Carnet flew uh, past my record flight. He flew um, into the Romney Marshes, um, and I think he'd done 30-odd miles. And the, the goal was always to get to Dill, Dill Beach, on the, on the golf course. And um, Michel Carnet beat me to that one, and he got there. And it's funny because uh, the following year, I got to Dill, but I didn't get to the beach. And I phoned him from a deal phone box and I said to him, hey, Michel, because he was French. I said, hey, Michel, it's Johnny. Uh, I am in deal. And, <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, where are you phoning from? I said, a coin box. He said, can you see the sea? And I said, no. And he said, then you aren't a deal, mate. <laughs> Which, and I went, oh, damn. And uh, it was probably another five years before I actually got to the golf course to actually say I could honestly say I landed at Deal. Funny, because I said to the, I this lady outside the phone box, I said, how far is the sea from here? And she said, oh, it's about a mile down there, love. And I went, oh, right, OK. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, damn, Carnay beat me again. But, uh, yeah, so th that was... That, that, that's how hang gliding progressed, you know, suddenly from being able to stay in the air and stay up and top land to seeing how far you can fly. I mean, goal flights, goal flights are the ones that, you know, you, you remember the most. And, and even my, an out and return flight that I did um, from Devil's Dyke to Butzer and back is a, obviously a really memorable flight but even more memorable was a flight that I'd done last year when I took off at Bow Peep Hill um, turned turned right into the into the, the bowl there which we call the paragliding bowl and nearly went down I got flushed down the front of the hill thought I was going to land got a thermal from about 50 to less than 100 feet off the ground and climbed back up level with launch shouted to the paragliders don't launch till I get above your launch don't launch whatever you do and um and climbed out and then ended up going to butts it's past butts to mercury and then back a little bit to make life easy for fran who's going to pick me up and the, the the just the thought of you know nearly landing and then achieving a declared goal uh miles and miles away it's just and flying through all the, the the sea breeze convergence that there was that day and just it was just a awe-inspiring flight i just really wished i'd got it on on video people that have most influenced me in hang gliding well there's been there's been lots actually there's too many people to mention you know people that take up hang gliding people that stick with hang gliding people that go to competitions, people that are always out there flying the flag for hang gliding, they're all an inspiration to me. 
I obviously would like to stay hang gliding for a couple more years if I can stay fit and healthy. Um, I'm 68 years old now. Uh, my goal, I suppose, the, the, the one goal that I would like to achieve is that it was pointed out to me, and I didn't know this, but it was pointed out to me by somebody, um, I think it was Tony Stevens, said, do you realise, Johnny, this was back in 2010, he said, do you realise, Johnny, that if you come in the top 10 of the British nationals in this decade, um, you would have been in the top 10 of the British nationals in hang gliding at least once in the last five decades. And I went, really? And he said, well, yeah, it's been checked out. So I said, well, if you say so. Now, so I did, I came in the top 10, I think it was in 2010. So therefore, you know, in five decades, you could say oh, I've been in the top 10. Now, the next decade is 2020, which is two years from now. Um, so if I can stay healthy and if I can get in the top 10, which is getting harder, um, if I can get in the top 10 of the nationals, um, out of the Brits in, in a international, in a national competition, which is usually held, you know, in the South of France or somewhere abroad. Uh, if I can stay healthy enough to be able to launch and fly and, and come in the top 10, then it would be really lovely to say I've come in the top 10 in six decades which will make a bit of a benchmark for people to beat in the future. So, yeah, that, that would be, that's my last goal, if you like, um, that I'd like to achieve if I can. Not making myself look too good here, am I? <laughs> <laughs>